When I was a young gearhead, I studied the masters as best I could. And I remembered things that they said, and they stuck in my head, and I used them as golden rules to go by. So among all of these things was something that Bill Jenkins had said when he was talking about the optimum operating temperature for an engine to make power. And his answer to that was 212 degrees, or easy enough to remember the boiling point of water. So for maximum power and efficiency, you want the engine, well, power and efficiency from a, from a hot rod, from a drag race standpoint, you want the engine to run at approximately 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Done! Easy enough to remember. And it's something I just stuck there and never gave it another thought. But I never questioned it. It was just, okay, why? Why 212 degrees? Never thought about it until now. Because now it makes perfect sense. And I understand why he, was, he went for that 212 degrees. It makes sense to me now because we're having problems with Plan Z. Launching Plan Z. Because no matter how much accelerator pump I give this thing, I cannot launch it from off idle. I have to actually have the motor loaded up against the converter before it'll launch. But if I flat punch it, even with all of the, the, the accelerator pump, all of the fuel I'm throwing at this thing, it just falls on its face. And I need to be able to work the converter and have the car launch hard. I need to be able to come just off idle, be able to lay into it and have the engine run up and slam into the converter. And that'll launch the car. That's, I believe, the biggest the biggest chunk of missing ET we have, I think that's where we're going to find it. All right, so why are we having this issue? Well, I, did, I deduced last week, looking at this, we did the video on this, that we don't have any heat in the intake manifold. There's nothing, there's not enough heat at the base of the intake manifold to lighten up some of the fuel into vapor and allow it to take that hit from idle. It, even after the engine is warmed up. Now it's typical for an engine that's cold that when you flat punch it, it'll just stall, regardless of how big an accelerator pump you have in it. As the engine warms up, now it'll take that, it'll take the gas and it'll run. So the 212 degrees, the 212 degrees is a good ballpark figure as to when the gasoline is going to boil or vaporize create some vapor for the spark plug to light. Now this is completely different than a hot vapor engine. We'll get to that in a minute. But think of the vapor in, in this equation as a fuse to light the atomized fuel. See, all right, a, a completely hot vapor engine would run out of its charge almost immediately because vapor is extremely volatile. You know, as soon as you light vapor, poof, it's gone. Okay. But atomized gas burns for a period of time because there's space between the droplets and the fire has to go from one droplet to the next. And so that chain, that, 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 that duration, that, that chain leads to a duration of burn, which means that the piston is under power for that many more degrees of duration. So if you were to light only vapor, just hot vapor, let's say the engine would make really good sharp power for about 20 or maybe 25 degrees of crankshaft rotation past top dead center. But when you have the fuel, a mixture of vaporized and atomized, the vaporized part is the fuse, and it's all used up just a couple of degrees past top dead center, but then the atomized fuel takes over from that point and continues driving the piston down 30, 40 degrees past top dead center. And that's why the higher, the higher, horsepower, higher horsepower engines or combinations fuels have their characteristic as a long duration of burn, nitromethane. It burns all the way down. You know, it's an extremely long duration burn. When you add nitrous oxide, you're adding fuel to the combustion chamber. The nitrous oxide allows you to burn that extra fuel. That extra fuel adds to the degrees of rotation that the crankshaft is going to be powered by. Duration of burn is, is the, the cornerstone of performance, of, of, of power. So that's why you don't want too much vapor. Too much vapor is too volatile, it'll happen too quick. But a little vapor, some vapor, is important because that's the fuse that the spark plug lights that then lights the heavier atomized mixture or the, or the droplets. 
And then that did cause a lot of debate and, and discussion in the vid in the comments of that video that we did. As people were like, I thought you don't want vapor. You know, the vapor is no good. A vapor engine and having vapor in the combustion chamber, two completely different things. So never the twain shall meet. Now we also had people that were like adamant that high performance intake manifolds don't have heat. And they're right, high performance intake manifolds don't have heat. Another quote from Jenkins, you want your engine to run like its feet are in the oven and its head is in the icebox. And that's exactly how, I mean, look, look at a typical high performance engine. The carburetor is way high. It's insulated from the rest of the engine through the intake manifold. And then the bottom end of the motor is where all the heat is and the top end of the motor stays cold. That's your ideal situation because the cold air brings the most oxygen to the party and gives you the most bang for the buck. But you still need some vapor. All right. So now let's use, just in case you're not, you're not catching on with this completely, let's use a, st a stock engine, a regular carburetor stock engine with a choke as the example, the best way to illustrate this. When the engine is ice cold, the choke is closed, right? The, way, the starting procedure for a carbureted engine, a cold carbureted engine, is to pump the gas once or twice to set the choke, because the choke is spring-loaded, so the choke closes when you open the gas, and then it gives it a squirt or two from the accelerator pump. So now you're priming the engine with some raw gas, and you're also cutting off the air supply to the engine. So as soon as it cranks, it has no choice but to draw that heavy, wet, dense mixture, not even a mixture, a liquid, into the combustion chamber. Now at that point, when you crank the engine, the spark plug is not going to light the liquid gasoline. The liquid itself doesn't burn. What burns are the fumes coming off the top of it. The same stuff that you would smell. You take gasoline, you smell it. Well, that's what the spark plug is lighting when the engine is ice cold. So, engine initially lights off of the fumes or the vapors coming off of the raw gasoline. Now, after 15 seconds, 20 seconds like that, the choke starts to open and the motor starts to smooth out a little bit. You can actually bring the idle down. What is happening in that period of time? Right. The very first aid to combustion that happens is the back face of the intake valve starts to get hot because it's got, it's got fire on one side and it transfers the heat to the other side. Now, as that mixture is coming through the carburetor, still partially choked carburetor, and down into the intake manifold in the plenum, which is still cold, it's wet, dense liquid, but it's Coming down the, down the track, it hits the back face of the intake valve. A little of it vaporizes because it hits the heat. It vaporizes, and now when that partially vaporized mixture goes into the combustion chamber, it becomes easier for the spark plug to light it. And as this continues, that the valve gets hotter and the, the port around it starts to get hot and the head of the piston gets hot. Now you need less and less well, you can, you can allow more and more air in so the choke opens up until eventually the motor is fully warmed up. And even though there's no vapor coming from the carburetor, there's very little vapor being generated in, in the intake manifold. The combustion chamber is getting plenty of vapor from the hot intake valve and the hot lower runner surfaces. So high performance en engines don't have heat to the intake. There's no heat crossover to, to warm the plenum underneath. There's no, there's no external heat, but they're always subjected to some radiant heat. And the tunnel ram is a perfect example of that. Let's go look at the tunnel ram. Okay, so here is the ultimate thoroughbred drag racing intake manifold. And clearly, the whole idea of this, well, part, a big part of the idea, is to isolate the carburetors and the upper plenum, the incoming air charge from engine heat. So like there's just as, as much consideration as possible given to keep in the top of this cold. You want it cold, you don't want the fuel hot because the fuel, if the fuel is hot, it's expanded, you don't get as much through the jet. You don't want the air coming in to be hot. Cold air carries more oxygen. So you want all of this to be nice and cold. But down here, the runners are connected directly to the intake manifold. And this part of the intake, this is where it gets hot. And this is where the 
vaporization takes place. So when you give this thing gas, the accelerator pumps squirt straight down into the runners. As it travels down the runner, it finds the heat, the latent heat that's coming up from the cylinder head. It partially vaporizes, and then you've got a good solid mixture to light. You do have to let these things get nice and warm before they'll, they'll function properly. You'll get the same situation like this. You could have the engine completely warm, but the runners haven't really warmed to that temperature yet. You don't get the vaporization, and you'll get a flat spot here too. But that's the whole point here. The top of the intake manifold, cold air coming in here and all of that. The engine's operating like its head is in the icebox, and its feet are in the oven. Now, we go over to our slant six, and we have a problem. So on that tunnel ram engine, we've got the carburetor located directly above the intake runners. So when you give it gas and the accelerator pump squirts raw fuel in, gravity is taking that raw fuel and sending it directly down the pipe to the hotter parts or the, harder, the, the, the runner, the hottest parts of the intake track, and it's seeing partial vaporization. Here, we have no gravity helping us. When we hit the throttle, the accelerator pumps are just squirting into this plenum right here. And there's no gravity to pull it this way. So because we don't have that continuity of motion the way you do from, you know, from up here to down low, there's no continuity of motion. So when you give it gas, before the engine can actually take that heavy liquid fuel and pull it down the runner, the engine stalls, it sputters, it dies. That's where our problem is. And before we get to our experiment, because now we're going to figure out how much heat do we actually need? What do we need to add to this manifold to create that vaporization in the, in the manifold itself? I'm going to do an experiment. But before we do that, a couple of things. First off, this is not a stock intake manifold. There were like a dozen guys that, that wrote in the comments. Oh, maybe if you put an aftermarket manifold on it, this is an aftermarket manifold. This is an often house of four barrel intake manifold. It maybe looks like a stock intake manifold because it's red. I don't know, did the color throw you guys? But no, this is a four barrel intake manifold. Now, another one, and every time we do anything on this, I get people comment about the orientation of the carburetor, saying that the carburetor should be facing this way with the primary blade. Some people say the primary blade is closest to the engine. Some people say the primary blade is furthest away from the engine. Guys, you're wrong. Now, deal with it. This intake manifold comes stock with it oriented this way. Okay? I literally had to make an adapter to turn the carburetor this way. Now, why did I do that? Well, because if you bother to read the Direct Connection Slant 6 Racing Manual, they talk about this intake manifold, they talk about this carburetor, and they specifically say to turn it this way so that, so that it's facing north-south instead of east-west. The fuel distribution is fine here. Both barrels dump into the center of the plenum. They gave, they gave uh, their jetting, what they determined to be the jetting on this, and the stagger on their jetting is not far from what I have over here. But don't argue with me as to whether or not this is the right way to do it. Take it up with the guys who wrote the Direct Connection factory racing manual for the Slant 6. Right? Take it up with the factory engineers. I'm just a YouTuber, okay? This is the way Chrysler said to do it. This is the way I'm doing it. All right, so let's get on with our experiment. Okay, so now we've deduced that our stumble is due to a lack of heat in the floor of the intake manifold, which is leading to a lack of vaporized gasoline, which isn't giving us the fuse that we need to light the heavy mixture coming in from the accelerator pump. Okay, so we need to create some vapor, but not too much vapor. We need to increase the, the heat or the temperature of the intake manifold, but not too much, because if we go too much, it becomes self-defeating because hot air carries less oxygen than cold air. So we want to create just enough at the bottom of the intake, the floor of the plenum, to give us some vaporization. How much do we need? So back in Jenkins' day, the 212 degrees number would have worked out perfectly for the gasoline they were using at the time. 
because 50 years ago, gasoline was formulated specifically so that it wouldn't boil. And I, I imagine, I don't have a sample of it to test, but I imagine it was pretty close to 212 degrees. Today's gas is formulated differently. Today's gas does not have those anti-boil qualities. And in fact, now all of the gas that we use in all of our cars, I stick to strictly pump gas, 10% ethanol gas, because that's what is available to everybody all the time, everywhere, and that's what we use. So this car is running on 93 octane pump gas, 10% ethanol pump. And here's a sample of it from the car. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take this sheet of aluminum, which is going to represent the, the floor of the plenum, and we're going to see how hot we have to get this thing to create vaporization, but not too much. We want to find the minimum heat necessary to give us a desired result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat the this sheet of aluminum with this map gas torch and I'm going to check the temperatures and we're going to stop at different intervals. We'll stop at let's say 25 degree intervals and see at what point we get vaporization when we give it a squirt simulating the accelerator pump from our bottle. So Let's see, current temperature of this thing is 85 degrees, room temperature here now. So here, let's, uh, let's do this cornice section right here. So I know we're not going to have any action at 100, so let's go to like 125. This may take a few minutes because it's a pretty substantial sheet of aluminum plate, so it's dissipating heat like crazy. All right, so there's 94. A hundred. I'm gonna go to 125. One hundred seven, one hundred eight, one ten, one thirteen, one hundred nineteen. It just it reaches certain temperatures and then it just stops. One twenty one twenty six right there. Okay, we got some, you can see the vapors here. Alright, so we got we got some vapor at 125. I think we're going to go a little bit more. Hang on a second. Let's go to 150. This cools off really fast. We're still not back to the 125, which is one of the problems I'm having with that intake manifold, because it's aluminum, and the aluminum just dissipates heat like crazy. Now, you know, you'll often hear people say that iron heads will tend to make more power than aluminum heads. And uh, this is probably the reason why. Okay, so there's one, one thirty-five. One forty. 
Audi. Now look how long it's taken for this sheet of aluminum to warm up. This is the exact situation I'm having with this car. Where I'm, I'm, I assumed I wasn't letting it warm up long enough and this is it. After this we're going to take the thermometer over to the car and see how long it takes. Alright, so there's one, one 145 and we got 150 okay that's I got substantially more vapor there now look at this gasoline boiling at 100, 142, okay, so it's down 142 degrees, and look at the way this gasoline boils. Now you want to talk about vapor lock, right? All right, well, there you go. I'm going to shoot for 150 degrees. We're going to shoot to have the floor of that intake manifold at 150 degrees. So now let's go start the motor and see what it attains after the block and the head are completely warmed up, but the intake manifold, let's see how far behind it is. All right, so 125 and a minimum, 150 probably about maximum, and I think anything over 150, like you know 175 or so, is going to just be too hot overall. So we want to see what it takes to get that intake manifold to 150 degrees. Okay, that was pretty interesting. The car ran for 14 minutes before we were able to attain 150 degrees under the carburetor. So at, at its peak, right before we shut it off, we had 120 at the cylinder head. We had 180 on the runner. So there was a 40 degree difference. And the only difference between the head and the runner is the gasket, the intake manifold gasket. And then we had 150, we, we shut it off when we achieved 150 under the carburetor right here. So it's cooled off since. We're at 136 now. Which is still in the range where we could, you know, we could expect some vaporization there. So previous to this, I was running this thing for, at the max five or six minutes before we would pull up and, and make our run. So at that, at that point, there was definitely not enough heat down here. It took 14 minutes for the bottom of the intake to reach that 150 degree target. So now that's what we have to do. I could, we could probably take a shortcut and add a heating element to the bottom of the carburetor. But I'll tell you the truth, I would rather for this time out, we're going to go out this Saturday. For this time out, I'm going to let the engine run and we're going to monitor the temperatures before we go out and, and pull around into the lanes. So, with any luck, with that at 150 degrees, our bog should be gone. We should be able to drive it off idle, lay into the gas, and have the car actually work the converter and pull. This is what we're going to try. I'm afraid that if I do add something, let's say I, I add a, a, like a shield or a heating element, something to tie header heat to the bottom of the plenum, I may go too far. Because, again, we want to maintain a minimum heat necessary to do the job. If we get the intake manifold where the, in, the whole manifold is up in the 220 degrees range, let's say matching the rest of the engine, well it's going to be too hot and we're not going to have that rich, oxygen rich, dense, cool mixture going through. Our only goal here right now is just that when we open a throttle and the accelerator pump dumps fuel into it, 
we want it to hit the floor of the plenum, vaporize, and let that get sucked in as the fuse to pull in the rest of the mixture, or at least let the engine work from idle with that heavy mixture like that. So that's the plan for Saturday. We're going to let this thing run, monitor the temperature, not move the car until this is 150 degrees, and we go from there. Interesting though, I didn't think it was going to boil away boil the way it did at 150 degrees. I figured maybe 175 we'd really get like action, but it just goes to show you how low the temperatures, the temperature we're dealing with when you're talking about things like vapor lock and whatnot and fuel percolation in the carburetor. It's interesting to see exactly what temperatures we're dealing with because 150 degrees is nothing, especially to an engine that's like in traffic and with you know the hood closed and, and everything else. It, it's really easy for the intake system, the carburetor, to reach 220, 250 degrees. And at that point, everything is just churning. So, all right, I hope you got something out of that. I hope we get results out of that. And if not, then we go back to the drawing board and we do whatever we have to to raise the temperature even more. I'll see you tomorrow.